What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. Today, we're going down a list. Five players that you should let your idiot teammates draft. Most of the guys on this list are here because your idiot teammates, they've heard the name. A lot of hype. Maybe they're a rookie. Maybe they're a veteran. At one point or another, these guys have been hyped into outer space, but the value in which where you're drafting them does not coincide with what they're going to return to your fantasy teams in 2021 fantasy football. All right. We've got no bullshit for you today. We've got a lot of stuff on the agenda, so we've got no time to waste. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy the video, make sure you smash the button underneath the video that says subscribe. Okay. If you did it right, it will say subscribe duh, afterwards. And then there's a button that looks like this. Click that as well, please. It lets YouTube know that you enjoyed the video. Thus, I'll keep making them for you. Okay? Five players in fantasy football this year to let your idiot teammates draft. You'll know the deal. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. And let's eat. First up on this list. We're going to start you off with a little super flex love, a little quarterback action. We're actually going to do a teammate stack here. We'll get to the second player afterwards. But Matt Ryan, man, and this one hurts. Everything about this offseason has hurt my heart as a Falcons fan. As soon as we let Julio Jones go, nothing's been the same. Really excited about getting Arthur Smith there. And I was like, listen, offense, been good. Defense, on the glow up. Arthur Smith coming over, wildly efficient, offensive-minded person. I'm happy that we brought in an offensive-minded person because when you start to rely on your OC to do well, guess what? They get fucking hired. Stop hiring defensive-minded coaches, okay? And stop hiring defensive-minded coaches who aren't even good at defense. Shout out to Dan fucking Quinn. I don't even know who's worse at their job, Dan Quinn or Brady Quinn. You tell me. Matt Ryan, ADP right now, quarterback 15 in super flex leagues right now. Uh, sleeper, some of y'all draft on Sleeper. Some of you guys might be unfamiliar with Sleeper. But Sleeper has been putting together lists of their ADP, which is actually pretty helpful right now because they do a lot of super flex leagues. Uh, Underdog does not have super flex available on the platform yet. So we've got to take our ADP from Sleeper, which I think is the most accurate ADP after Underdog. Okay, so super flex leagues see Matt Ryan go off the board in the beginning of the sixth round, also as quarterback 15. I don't know how this became a hot take, but when a quarterback loses, arguably the most talented wide receiver we've ever seen step foot grace the NFL fields, the gridiron, when that guy leaves, we should expect the dip off in play, All right? It's become a hot take. People still think Matt Ryan's going to be great. This offense is going to be a historic fucking passing offense. I'm like, by by what logic, by what calculations? I'm rocking a TI-84 plus. You guys must be rocking the fucking TI-22 because I don't know where you're getting your math numbers from. Julio Jones, huge part of this Falcons offense since the day he stepped foot on the field. Matt Ryan, Graham Barfield's tweet, since 2012, these are Matt Ryan's splits with and without Julio Jones. There's a 22-game sample size, and it hurts. 33 fewer passing yards per game, 0.3 fewer touchdowns per game, the interceptions skyrocket, the win percentages. It's just, it's just all bad. It's just all bad. And like I said in yesterday's mock draft video, yesterday we did a 12-team mock draft video, which I will link down below. It'll be at the end of the video, so you can click on the end screen as well. Matt Ryan thrived solely on volume last year. I want, I want to drive this point home. He finished as the quarterback 12 in fantasy last year. So you're like, oh, quarterback one, why are we fading him? We're picking him out his floor. He finished as a quarterback 12 in fantasy last year, despite leading the NFL in pass attempts. So imagine a running back leading the NFL in carries and finishing as the RB12. A wide receiver leading the NFL in targets and finishing as the wide receiver 12. That shit doesn't happen, okay? But with Matt Ryan, it happened. We look at Dirk Cutter being gone, right? Dirk Cutter literally didn't know how to run the fucking ball. Thus, every offense within Dirk Cutter's fingertips have been like a 68% pass rate offense. He's gone. Their defense got much better towards the second half of the year once Dan Quinn, the defensive-minded coach, got the fuck out of Atlanta. So we're talking about a better defense. We're talking about fewer passes because Dirk Cutter is gone. The passing volume just overall is going to go very far down. So you have a mid-volume quarterback with uh, efficiency, okay? Behind an offensive line last year who ranked 23rd in pass blocking. Uh, PFF has updated the rankings going into 2021, and they are currently ranked the Falcons offensive line 24th in the NFL. I'm going to pass big time on Matt Ryan. And these are just not the guys you want to be taking in fantasy. If you're in a one-quarterback league, don't even think about taking Matt Ryan, right? We want upside. We want we even guys that are going in the same vicinity whose floor might be lower than Matt Ryan. 
But if they have any sort of upside, you're taking them over Matt Ryan because you could just hit the waiver if not in a one quarterback league because there are so many quarterbacks available. In two QB leagues, in super flex leagues, yes, we talk about how it's okay to go safety with your second quarterback pick, all right? It's okay to have a floor there. But there are also Kirk Cousins and Baker Mayfields going after Matt Ryan in super flex drafts. And I would easily prefer both of those guys over Matt Ryan. So do not be drafting Matt Ryan in fantasy football this year. Do not be drafting his newly acquired teammate, the fourth overall pick in the NFL draft this year, Kyle Pitts in redraft. Okay, in redraft underdog ADP right now. This is weird. I don't know how there's a discrepancy here this large, but underdog ADP has him at 46. And those are all paid leagues. Okay, those are all paid leagues. And a lot of the ADP has pre Julio Jones being traded factored into it 46 overall that is the 410 tight end four so you're using your fourth round pick on kyle pitts sleepers super flex adp has him at 38 so the 402 i don't know how that makes sense how it's a super flex league and he's going earlier but it tells you just overall you're going to be using your fourth round pick on Kyle Pitts. I can't really tell you anything that you haven't already heard this summer, right? It's played out. People like the argument for Kyle Pitts is that even if he had the single best rookie season of all time, like that's not a personality trait, people in the fantasy industry. Y'all need to hear that, but we're going to talk about it regardless. The the single greatest fantasy season ever from a fantasy points perspective, half PPR was Evan Ingram in 2017. Full PPR, it was Jeremy Shockey in 2002. They were like a couple points apart. Last year, it, it, say say Kyle Pitts goes out there and has those seasons, the greatest single half PPR performance or the greatest single PPR performance. Last year, he would finish as the tight end four in half PPR. He would finish as the tight end five in full PPR. That's just not what I want to be using my fourth round pick on in fantasy football drafts, where you can be going with guys like David Montgomery, where you could be going with really high upside wide receivers, where you could be getting your quarterback one, where you can be getting your Ryan Tannehill, where you can be getting your Tom Brady in super flex leagues. All right. The problem with the tight end position is if you're not posting elite numbers, if you're not doing what Kelsey did last year, if you're not doing what Darren Waller did last year, you're not worth taking in fantasy. Look at this chart and here are the point per game numbers for the tight end rankings. The big point to drive home here is having a good player at a position is not the same as having a positional advantage in fantasy football. It's really important to understand that because you look at this list and this is typically what we see year in and year out. We're so top loaded at the position. So unless you think Kyle Pitts is going to have a Darren Waller or Travis Kelsey type season, which is so fucking low probability for him to, for him to go off for 120 targets, a thousand yards, eight touchdowns, really, really unlikely. He's going to fall into that mold. Like you look at tight end four, tight end five, they're not performing on a per game basis that much better than like the tight end fucking 12 or 15 it's really really what it comes down to and Pitts might have a great rookie season by all accounts like 60 catches 700 yards six touchdowns one of the better rookie tight end seasons ever it's still not even close to warranting his fourth round price tag right now right like we're not baking any risk into it that he just is mediocre or any kind of downside in which I don't know injury whatever the fuck you want to put into it there's just no risk being taken at his fourth round ADP right now you have guys like TJ Hawkinson who already he just had over 100 targets at the tight end position last year. And now Galladay is gone. Marvin Jones is gone. And he's going two rounds later, sometimes three rounds later in underdog drafts. I've gotten him in the seventh round before, later than Pitts, okay? That's crazy to me. So Pitts is exciting, and someone in your league is going to get very excited about him. But do not be the one drafting him in the fourth round of redraft leagues, please, okay? And do not be the one drafting Odell Beck. I don't know how many years in a row I got to tell you all Stop doing this. Stop drafting Odell Beckham. Underdog ADP right now of 57. 57 overall at the 509. So you're using your fifth round pick on Odell. Are you fucking kidding me? If y'all want to see Underdog's ADP, by the way, I will link the download to their app right in the description. It'll be one of the first ones down there. Uh, it'll take you to the iOS store. It'll take you to the Google store, the Android store, whatever phone you're rocking, whatever mobility we're working with over here. That link will take you directly there. Uh, Underdog is where you can do your best ball drafts. It's the best way to prepare for your 2021 fantasy football season. All the drafts are $3. Uh, you can do drafts that are $3 or more if you're a little risque, if you want to diversify the revenue a little bit. And when you deposit $10 on Underdog using the promo code BDGE, you're going to get $25 free dollars on top of it okay so you can either do that through underdogfantasy.com or through the link that will take you to the app store down below promo code bdge and yes you win leagues when you do these drafts okay best ball if you finish in the top three you're gonna win money just like a regular fantasy football league and like a regular fantasy football league you should not be drafting odell beckham in the fifth round all right i don't i like i just don't know who needs to hear this again he is turning 29 and he's got a fucking injury history longer than a cvs receipt if you just look at the last few years ACL tear, sports hernia, quad, quad contusion, four games missed, fibula fracture, high ankle sprain. I mean, we we literally saw him play a full 16 games in 2019, and he was out-targeted, out-caught, out-yardaged, out-tuddied by Jarvis Landry. 
all all those categories. Jarvis Landry bested Odell Beckham when they both played 16 games together. Okay. And you might say, hey, that was a different offense. Okay. So now we're going with a more run heavy offense and you think that's good for Odell Beckham Jr.? No, no. And now you pile on another big time injury, this ACL tear that happened last year. And I know they've They've become easier to come back from, and we're a little bit less concerned with an injury like an ACL tear, but we're usually less concerned, right? This is this has been a big learning point for me as a fantasy analyst over the last bunch of years. Injuries, I think, are like the most underrated part of fantasy that people can really get an advantage over their league mates on when we're talking about ACLs. We want guys that are two years removed from ACL tears, not one year removed, but we're willing to push the button a little bit if the player is younger, if the reports are good. Odell Beckham's not younger anymore. He's not the 23-year-old. He's not the 24-year-old that he used to be that was fast, explosive. He has a lot of injuries on his resume now, and that's tougher and tougher. And each time one of those happens, it becomes tougher to come back from. Each time you, you hit a birthday, it gets tougher and tougher to come back from. He's going to be 29 years old coming from an ACL tear. We don't have a ton, a ton of historic compilations of people doing that successfully. So let Odell Beckham... Let, let let someone else in your league try to draft prime Odell Beckham for the fourth year in a row. Let let him slip, please. Let Juju Smith-Schuster slip as well. He's not even injury related. He just stinks, okay? He's going 79 overall at the 707. And in yesterday's mock draft video, you guys actually saw me draft him, but I got him in the eighth round. I got him at like, I think it was like the 8-8 or 8-9. So it was a whole like round and a half later than what his actual ADP is. Juju is now stepping into a Steelers offense in which he is the fourth best option right? Deontay Johnson is an elite separator and commanded far more targets than Juju did last year. When you look at the chart, he is just elite in every type of coverage. Chase Claypool is coming off of a monster rookie season and one in which he was limited in playtime. And that is destined to absolutely spike given what we saw from him as a rookie year and the versatility that he shows against different types of press coverages, man coverage, zone coverages, what he could do down the field, what he can do in the red zone. Chase Claypool is a monster. Now we have Najee Harris coming in as a first round pick who's going to command like 20, uh, 20 plus touches off the rip. Okay. So don't, don't be surprised if Juju Smith-Schuster isn't in in on many two wide receiver sets this year. He is by far and away the worst separator out of the three wide receivers that should be starters for Pittsburgh. When you look at the success rate in Matt Harmon's reception perception, one of the best pieces of uh, one of the best resources in the industry right now, in my opinion, for wide receivers, fourth percentile success rate versus man coverage, sixth versus press. He's just, it was just right place, right time for a lot of things that happened in that Pittsburgh offense a few years back. But do not get fooled by who Juju Smith-Schuster is at this point. He is not a separator, two wide receiver sets. There's no reason for him to be out there. And and you don't have to take my word for it because you could literally just take the Steelers word for it. They gave him a one year, eight million dollar contract. You might say it's savvy by Juju to wait until the TV money comes in so he could sign elsewhere for a big contract. But one year for eight million, that is the 29th highest paid wide receiver in the league this year. And you could say like 29, that's not that low, but that also like rookie contracts are factored into there because they can't get paid that much money. But that is less dollars. You know, like Corey Davis went out and commanded twelve and a half million dollars per year, thirteen million dollars per year. Nelson Aguilar, eleven million dollars per year. Sterling Shepard is getting paid more than Juju Smith Schuster. Randall fucking Cobb is getting paid more than Juju Smith Schuster. Okay. So that should tell you they have no allegiance to keep him on the field for two wide receiver sets. I wouldn't be surprised if we started seeing Juju start becoming a 70%, 65% snap player in an offense is going to be a lot more run heavy than they were last year. You could look at Juju's target numbers from last year and say, oh, they're pretty high raw total number. But when you look at the actual team target share, when you look at the, the passing rate by the team, it won't be the same this year. And it's going to get ugly as will the situation in Jacksonville for James Robinson, man. It's hard. It's, it's, it's going to be hard for some of your league mates to look at what James Robinson did as a rookie. Absolute ball and ass season. Okay. One of the best rookie seasons ever by a running back, especially an undrafted free agent, probably the single best undrafted free agent season as a rookie, you know, it's whatever. I didn't do the fucking research on it. Somebody else can yell at me in the comment section about it. But similar to Leonard Fournette's big years with Jacksonville, a lot of it was simply massive opportunity. It was volume based. James Robinson literally led all NFL running backs last year in opportunity share. Like the percentage of opportunities that went to a single running back in a backfield, James Robinson led the NFL in it. Now, everything about the Jags offense this year was reset. They, they, they just smashed the refresh button on it. F5, F5, F5. I don't know what you old fucking Google Android users have. F4, F5, whatever. They hit the refresh button on it. They have Urban Meyer coming in as a new head coach. And the first thing he did to pledge his allegiance to James Robinson was go out and sign Carlos Hyde and then use a first round pick on Travis Etienne. Not a lot of confidence there in James Robinson. There goes right off the rip with those two guys coming in, probably 30% of James Robinson 
Johnson carries gone and a shitload of his targets off the board now. What happens on the goal line, man? Uh, who knows? James Robinson had like five or six goal line carries last year. Wasn't pretty. They don't have a lot of scoring opportunities, or at least they didn't. They'll be a little bit better with Trevor Lawrence there, of course, but still not a, an amazing offense by any means. It'll take them a year probably to develop into the offense that we want them to be. Didn't have a lot of goal line opportunities last year. Now you add in Carlos Hyde. Now you add in Travis Etienne. And now you add in a mobile quarterback, Trevor Lawrence. Who's to say Trevor Lawrence doesn't take 30 to 40% of the goal line carries there? How do we know he's not the new Josh Allen in Jacksonville? That's going to be a problem. Robinson feels a lot like what we got out of Josh Jacobs last year with a little bit less volume. So in games that they win, which Vegas projects them to win six and a half games, not a lot of games, we can project James Robinson to get a lot of work, right? I'm not saying he's going to be a fucking dud every single game, but to draft him in a redraft is a mistake because he'll have two to three games where he gets 20 carries, maybe scores one to two times. Those are big fucking games. But just like Josh Jacobs, those games are going to be few and far between. And it's going to be tough because you're a Jaguars team, okay? And we don't, we, it's hard to project which teams you're going to actually dominate against. You're not that much better than realistically, you know, maybe Detroit, maybe Houston. I have no idea if those guys are even on the schedule for, for uh, Jacksonville this year. But if they're not, we can't really project Jacksonville to just dominate any game. So it's going to be tough to know which games to start James Robinson in. So those big games are definitely going to happen, but they're definitely going to happen in a very limited capacity. And I don't want that type of production in a season long league. Like, yes, this team will be run heavy. I do think they're going to be run first, but so much much of James Robinson last year was volume dependent, just getting so much of the opportunity share. And you bring in Carlos Hyde and Carlos Hyde will probably only take like eight to 10% of the touches in the backfield, but that's a little slice off the pie. And then you add in first round pick Travis Etienne, another chunk of the targets, another chunk of the carries right off the the fucking James Robinson pie. And, uh, and that shit goes from looking like pumpkin pie to apple pie real quick. Terrible comparison. Cause I don't even, I don't even think I really like pumpkin pie that much. I think I like uh, kind of pies. Pies, I feel like fucking pies are overrated to begin with, to be honest with you. There you go. James Robinson, overrated. Pies, overrated. Don't eat, don't draft either of them, all right? And by not drafting either of them, y'all going to eat this year. That is my list of players to let your idiot league mates draft in 2021 fantasy football. Again, if you enjoyed the video, you found it, found it informative or entertaining or whatever the fuck you found it. If you found something in here that was cool, hit the subscribe button. We're doing videos like this every single day. Mock drafts on Monday, player analysis Tuesday through Friday. Friday, Q&A on Saturday. Subscribe, hit the thumbs up, and I will see y'all tomorrow. Peace.